The Bible is clear that when it comes and came to man's salvation, God is completely committed. You missed it. I'm going to give you a second chance. The Bible is clear that when it comes and came to the salvation of man, God is completely committed. and involved. And it was because the love of God towards us that He willingly came to this sin-infested, darkened world. Go to John 7. We're going to be in John a little bit today. Go to John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 7. John, chapter 7. John, chapter 7. Jesus says in the book of John, chapter 7, that He was sent What was he? Sent. John 7, look at verse 29. John 7, verse 29, and Jesus said, But I know him, for I am from him, and he, what did he do? He sent me. So Christ was what? He was sent. Not only that, The Bible says that not only was God sent, He was given. John 3.16 tells us that. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. The Bible says that Christ was sent and he was given. In other words, if Christ was sent and given, the Bible is telling us if you think that Jesus came willingly to this world. Did he not? That Jesus came willingly. What's the word? Willingly. He was sent. And he was given, and therefore he came willingly. But now let's get deeper. Go to John chapter 10. Jesus came willingly to this earth to save man. But God the Father gave him. If you really want to get into this is another sermon, but listen. All three members of the Godhead are deeply involved. God the Father gave His Son willingly. Jesus came to do His role, and the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, is now doing His part right now. Amen. All three are involved. Now in John chapter 10, look at verse 30 through 33. I hope you never come in contact how the, 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 the concept of the Godhead is being so attacked by even members of God's church. You can't and I can't understand God because God is God and we're not God, but this I know, God is one, three co-eternal persons. Now in John chapter 10, look at verse 30 through 33. The Bible says, and Jesus said here in John chapter 30, I and my Father are what? One. Now, what is Christ claiming here by this sentence? Yes, and they knew it. Let's keep reading. 31, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered to them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? Verse 33, And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. But Christ could do this. Can you say amen? I and my Father are one. So listen and think. If Jesus came willingly 
to die and save mankind, as we get deeper, God came willingly to die and save mankind. Are you with me? Go to John 10. Go, I'm sorry, John 5. Look at verse 17 and 18. Stay with me. God is completely committed to saving us. John 5, look at verses 17 and 18. The Bible says in John 5, 17, But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath according to them, Christ never broke the Sabbath. He might have broken the additional rules that the Pharisees had given. This is a very important point. You're probably going to hear it again. Listen carefully. Jesus never argued with the Pharisees over what day the Sabbath was. It was always over how the Sabbath was to be kept. I'm going to leave that there. We keep reading. Verse 18, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his Father, capital F, making himself equal with God. That's why Jesus says you should never call anyone Father in that respect. Can you say amen? You have an earthly Father, but it's never the capital F Father in the respect of Holy Father. Are you understanding? It's clear that God came willingly to save us. Are you with me? It wasn't a created being that God sent. It wasn't another angel. It wasn't a human being. It wasn't any... Cre no, no created thing could ever come and pay the price that... The, uh, that sin and uh, saving the, the, the human race could do. No created thing could ever solve this problem. Only God himself, only the life giver. That's why Paul says in the book of Hebrews here, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. It is impossible. These were just all symbols. Only the life giver himself could take that and make that a possible. No created thing could save man from the problem of sin, God himself, and God came willingly. Now, I'm going to share with you a quote here from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. Now, it's a little longer than I usually like to, uh, to give, but it's worth it. It's worth it. A little longer, but it's worth it. Again, I said that no created thing could pay the price and save man. God himself had to come, and he came willingly. Amen. But this is the everlasting gospel, and the plan of salvation goes well back beyond even man. And in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, look what we're told. Beautiful. The Son of God, heaven's glorious commander, was touched with pity for the fallen race. His heart was moved with infinite compassion as the woes of the lost world rose before him. But divine love had conceived a plan whereby man might be redeemed. Can you say amen? The broken law of God demanded the life of the sinner. In all the universe, there was but one who could, in behalf of man, satisfy its claims. Since the divine law is as sacred as God himself, only one equal with God can make atonement for its transgression. None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. Christ would, be, would, would, uh, Christ would take upon himself the guilt and shame of sin, sin so offensive to a holy God that it must separate the Father and his Son. Christ would reach the depths of misery to rescue the ruined race. Before the Father, he pleaded in the sinner's behalf while the host of heaven awaited the result with an intensity of interest that words cannot express. 
Long continued was the mysterious uh, co communing, the council of peace for the fallen sons of men. The plan of salvation had been laid before the mystery of, uh, before, sorry, had been laid before the creation of the earth, for Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Oh, the mystery of redemption, the love of God for a world that did not love him. Who can know the depths of the love which pathes knowledge? Through endless ages, immortal minds seeking to comprehend the mystery of that incom incomprehensible love will wonder and adore. We will study God's love for eternity. It is incomprehensible. You and I can't understand it. The love that God has for you and me. Are you with me? Only one. Almost done here. The angels could not rejoice as Christ opened before them the plan of redemption for they saw that man's salvation must cost their loved commander unutterable woe. He would leave his high position as the majesty of heaven, appear upon earth and humble himself as a man, and by his own experience become acquainted with sorrows and temptations which man would have to endure. Willingly, willingly. Are you with me? Stay with me. Last sentence or two. The angels prostrated themselves at the feet of their commander and offered to become a sacrifice for man. Get, get the picture. The, the heavenly beings, when they, when they heard the news of this, they were, they were troubled and they said, well, 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 Christ, you don't have to go. Send me. Send me. And I, can, I mean, maybe even Gabriel said, Lord, no, I'll go. But listen, look here. And it says here, but an angel's life could not pay the debt. Only he who created man had the power to redeem him. Only God himself, only the life giver could give the price for what? The debt of sin. Can you say amen? No angel could come. No created being, no bulls, no goats, no silver or gold could pay the price. Can you say amen? God willingly came, left all of majesty of heavens and came completely committed to save mankind, though mankind hated him. God is good. And if God gave us everything, does he deserve everything in return? God deserves everything in return. He willingly came. God invested everything for the salvation of man. He was emotionally involved as well. Go to the book of John 11. Take a look. What I want to show you here is that God and his desire to save man is that he's completely involved and dedicated, even emotionally. And you can't get more involved than even being emotionally involved because that's where the greatest hurt comes from is when you put yourself all out there, not just your body, not just your mind and, and mental capacity, but even all your emotions, everything, every aspect of God, mental, emotionally, physical, is involved for you and me. Amen. We're in John 11. Take a look at this. Say amen if you're in John 11. Now look at verse 35. In John chapter 11, verse 35, this is what they say is the shortest verse of all the Bible. And what does it say? Yes, right. Thank you, Leonard. Jesus wept. Now my question is, is why did Jesus cry here? And it wasn't for Lazarus. Go back a little bit to the story. Why is Jesus crying here? Why is Jesus weeping here is our question. And I'm going to show you it wasn't because Lazarus was dead. We're in John 11. Are you there? Let's study a little bit. Go back to verse 11. John 11, verse 11, okay? I hope you know the story here a little bit. Mary and Martha had a brother. His name was Lazarus. And what happened to Lazarus? He died. Christ was not around. So they went to send for Jesus. Are you with me? Okay. 
Now, the word got to Jesus. We're in verse 11, and it says, These things he said, and after that he said to them, to the disciples, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. So Christ has committed to go. And now here's my question. Did Christ have every intention to raise Lazarus from the dead? Yes. Don't miss it. Keep that in your mind there. Christ had every intention to raise Lazarus from the dead. Amen. We keep going. Verse 12, then the disciples said, Oh, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is... Okay, so Christ had every intention. I'm going to go and raise Lazarus from the dead. He had every intention to do this. Are you with me? We now come back or keep going through the story, and Christ comes, and look at verse 20. Are you in verse 20? Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Again, did he have every intention to raise Lazarus from the dead? Yes or no? He did. Keep reading. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I'm so thankful that Martha understood the biblical teachings of the state of the dead. Amen. Verse 25, and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is come to the what? Okay, so get the picture. The news comes to Jesus. Our friend Lazarus is, de is dying here. He stays a while, allowing this to happen because God, Jesus, was about to do something here on purpose. And he goes and says, I have every, I have every intention of raising Lazarus from the dead. Are you with me? He gets there. He comes there to where they are. Martha runs to him and says, oh, Lord, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. And Christ, again, says he is going to rise. I'm here to raise him up. Every intention to raise him from the dead. Are you with me? Now Christ comes to the tomb. Our question again is, why is Christ crying here? We're now in John chapter 11, and we're in verse 32. Again, our, why is Christ a, 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 a weeping here? And we're seeing it wasn't because Lazarus was dead. It has to be for something else. We're in verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, Oh, to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. She said the same thing as Martha. They, they were probably complaining, right? If he would have been here. And she runs to him. Let's keep reading. Verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in, his, in the spirit and was troubled. Why is he troubled here? Because Lazarus is dead? Because what is his intention? His, his, his sorrow is not for Lazarus because, hallelujah, when you sleep a little bit, you're going to get raised to life if you're in Jesus. Can you say amen? His hurting is for those who are still living. Are you with me? Let's keep reading. What verse are we on now? 34. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, oh, could this not man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Are there some doubting Thomases here, yes or no? Are there people who have no faith in Jesus here? Now we keep reading. Then Jesus, again groaning, verse 38, in himself came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha said, uh, the sister of him said, uh, uh, who was dead said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench for he has been dead for four days. Lord, I know that you're the life giver, but maybe you don't know what happens when somebody dies. It smells. Keep reading. 
Verse 40, and Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that it would, that he, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where, he, where, where, where the dead man was laying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that I have sa- heard me. Verse 42 is key. And I know that you have heard me, but because of the people who are standing. What's the issue? Lazarus? The people, right? Why is he? Lord, because of the people who are standing here. Let's keep reading what he says. Because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when they had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He had every intention of doing this. He was not crying for Lazarus. He was crying for the people. Verse 44, and he who died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Listen to me very carefully. God is emotionally involved here. He's weeping. He's crying. He's hurting. Are you with me? It's not just the physical. He didn't just come, and not just the mental in him. It's the, he's every, every aspect of God is involved, physical, emotional, mental, and he's weeping, not for Lazarus here, but for the people who are by. Now listen, and, not, and beyond them, listen. This isn't a game. He wept not for Lazarus, but for the people and their unbelief, and for those through history as well. He saw that many there, weeping, were going to betray him and die at the destruction of Jerusalem without any hope. The same people here that were with him will one day soon say, crucify him. The same people here that stood with him would one day be in Jerusalem in 70 AD and die because they did not want to hear the words of Jesus to flee and go to the mountains. God is weeping for those who just don't want to take Jesus seriously. In Desire of Ages, take a look. His tender, pitying heart is ever awakened to sympathy by suffering. He weeps with those that weep and rejoices with those that rejoice. Isn't that beautiful? What's my subtitle? God understands. He knows. He understands. But it was not only because of his human sympathy with Mary and Martha that Jesus wept and his tears there was a sorrow as high above human sorrow as the heavens are higher than the earth. Christ did not weep for Lazarus. I mean, that's biblically clear. For he was about to call him from the grave. He wept because many of those now mourning for Lazarus would soon plan the death of him who was the resurrection and the life. It was not only because of the, of the scene before him that Christ wept. The weight of the grief of ages was upon him. He saw the terrible effects of the transgression of God's law. He saw that the history of the world, beginning with the death of Abel, the conflict between good and evil, had been unceasing. Looking down the years to come, he saw the suffering and sorrow, tears and death that were to be a lot of men, the lot of men. His heart was pierced with the pain of the human family of all ages and in all lands. The woes of the sinful race were heavy upon his soul and the fountain of his tears were broken up as he longed to relieve all their distresses. Hallelujah. People say, oh, no one understands me or understands what I'm going through. I want to say today, God understands. He understands. He knows what it means to go what you're going through. He knows. If there's anybody else that you feel, you can be assured God understands your pain. God understands your suffering. God understands your hurt. God understands everything because he's gone through it. Go to Hebrews quickly as we begin to close here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, as we begin to close here. Hebrews 4, 15. I want to show God's people that God is completely committed to your salvation, and he understands what you're going through. 
Quickly, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Let's see who can beat me there. One second too late. One second too late. We have become calloused. We talk of God's love and we yawn and we say what's for dinner and what's on TV. And Is this a joke? Do you know that too many people today have a who cares attitude? Oh, who cares? Who cares? Who cares attitude? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares what the book cares? Who cares what the Bible? Who cares? Who c- Praise God that he didn't have that kind of an attitude. Amen. Everything, who cares? Well, it's not a big deal. It's a huge deal. This isn't a game. This is real life. Eternity with Jesus and God and no more sin or eternity never to exist again. This is serious business. God is completely in here, completely involved, emotionally, physically, mentally, everything is involved here. But yet God's people live their Christian experience like a, oh, whatever. I'll give God a little bit. God doesn't want a little bit. He wants everything. I'll follow God when after, my, after I'm done with school. Too late. Well, after I get married, I'll get serious. Too late. Now. Hebrews 4, 15. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Amen. So look at the screen here, last few slides. God understands. God understands what it is to be tempted. Amen? Look at this. God understands what it means to be tired physically and emotionally. He understands. God understands what it means to be betrayed. Amen? God understands what it means to be physically, phys- to, su- to suffer physically, I should have put there, to suffer emotionally. He understands. He understands what it means to be lonely. He understands what it means to be lonely. He understands what it means to be forsaken. He understands what it means to be abandoned and hurt and sad, falsely accused, hungry, thirsty, desperate. He understands. He understands. He understands what it means to be frustrated and upset and brokenhearted and happy and joyful, and mocked, and bullied. He understands. He understands what it means to be misunderstood and used. And the list goes on. God understands. You can see why God was so upset when people were worshiping. Just, they can't hear, can't see, can't speak, can't feel, and God's people just immersed in idolatry. And you say, well, I, I, I don't worship this standing here, but you know what? Whatever you put before God is what you worship. You know what? You know that money 
can't understand what you're going through? <laughs> God understands. You know that your car doesn't care. Your car doesn't care. God cares. You know your school, your diploma? Let me say this. I'm going to close, I promise. In the South, especially in Mississippi and Alabama, I don't know about here, college football is God. You guys agree with that? You should, it's true. When I encounter people who put athletes and schools and these athletics and they worship these things and I, I always tell them, I tell them straight up, I say, let me ask you a question. If you called, if you called uh, Nick Saban and you said, Nick Saban, I'm about to be evicted from my house. I need $300. This man makes millions of dollars. Do you think he's going to give you? He's going to say, who in the world are you? If you called the athletic department of Florida University, who makes literally millions and millions of dollars. And you call the athletic department, hey, you know what? Uh, my car broke down. I, I, I need your help. You're going to say, get out of here. We're not going to give you anything. Why would you worship these people if they're not going to do anything for you? Do you think that these people care what you're going through? Or these schools and athletic departments and football, and they don't care. Then why give them our allegiance over God? God cares. When you go to God, He cares and understands. Therefore, God comforts us and sympathizes with us. Here's my last verse, and we're done. 2 Corinthians 1, and then I'll close with prayer. But here's the thing. God sympathizes and comforts us so that, therefore, we can be a blessing and a comfort to others. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, take a look. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter one. <clears throat> Look at verse three and four. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Amen. Now look. Who comforts us in all our tribulation? that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Do you know that only those who have lost a child can comfort those who have also lost a child? Do you know only those who have suffered in certain ways can be a blessing and a comfort to those who are going through the same experiences? Yes. So as God sympathizes and comforts and deals with us, he then wants us to share that same with others and be a comfort and a blessing to others as we help others. Amen? And lead them to the almighty comforter. So listen, sometimes God allows things to happen because then you can truly minister to somebody who's going through the same exact thing. I've seen it. So my friends, I'm going to let you know that God is completely involved and committed for you. And he understands. 
Go to God. He understands. He understands. He understands. Who here today was not only to thank God for the kind of God that he is, but then want to be a blessing to somebody else's life who might be also suffering. Anybody? Amen. God is completely involved for you. Completely. He's all in. He's all in. He's all in. I pray that we can be all in.